Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we ended last year's conference with a presentation by Andrew Roberts, and we know a winning formula when we see one. <laughs> so to introduce Andrew this year, we have the beautiful Catherine Katz. Hello. I'll keep my remarks brief in order to maximize the amount of time we have to be informed and entertained by our next and final speaker, Andrew Roberts. And for those of you who recall his presentation on Sir Winston's charmingly lachrymose nature at last year's conference have undoubtedly been looking forward to this as much as I have. Amongst his numerous endeavors, Andrew Roberts serves as the guest curator of the exhibit Churchill's Shakespeare at the Folger Shakespeare Library. He's the author and editor of 19 books, including Masters and Commanders and The Holy Fox, which we've heard about a bit over the last few days. His most recent publication was a biography of Napoleon, a short work coming in at just under a thousand pages. And we are all eagerly awaiting his next book, what is sure to be the definitive single volume biography of Sir Winston Churchill, which will be published next year. So without further ado, on the subject of Churchill's sense of living history, Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Roberts. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited to address you, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Catherine, for those very kind words. Um, this morning, when we, uh, when we started this morning, David Freeman equated this conference to an opera. Um, and the, the only thing I know about opera is that the opera ain't over till the fat woman sings. Um, I think that's a really rather rude thing to say about me, frankly. One of the things that makes me proud to be an historian is that despite the pitfalls of my trade, um, which can be summed up as uh, penury, pedantry, and punditry, Nonetheless, the greatest man in history also chose it as his. More than anything other than a statesman and a soldier, Churchill thought of himself as an historian. And moreover, he also thought of his roles as statesman and politician almost entirely through the prism of history. He was far from being a model schoolboy, Jack Plum reminds us in his essay, The Dominion of the Past. He was idle, willful, self-involved, and quite stupid about mathematics or Latin but he was well ahead of his class in history and top of the examination in Sandhurst every time that he took it. He failed, of course, many times, but never in history. Indeed, so far from failing, Churchill has sold more history books than any other 20th century historian and possibly more than any historian ever. Um, and of course, Churchill was, had to be, um, I mean, he was largely self-taught, he was an autodidact. He had to be uh, self-taught owing to the fact that he went to Harrow. Um, <laughs> Randolph enjoyed that more than anything, anyone else, I think. Um, I, think it ex quote, I think it extremely difficult for anyone not born into Churchill's world or time, uh, Jack Plum also wrote, to realize what a dominance the past had over all his thinking and action. Difficult, perhaps, but let's try. In Churchill's very first formal public speech, uh, the one in, near Bath in 1897, he made reference to history, saying, there are not wanting those who say that in this jubilee year our empire has reached the height of its glory and power, and now that we shall begin to decline as Babylon, Carthage, Rome declined. Do not believe these croakers, but give the lie to their dismal croaking by showing by our actions that a vigor and vitality of our race is unimpaired. Um, I'm not going to do a, uh, a Churchill voice because Kevin did that. Um, <laughs> you can take that however you like. Um, he, uh, he liked to, Churchill liked to compare the British Empire to that of Rome. Um, it gave context and induced pride in his audiences, especially as the comparison was almost always made to the advantages of the former. History was a mainstay of his writing, thought, and speeches. And to give you a flavor of this, I'd like to throw a few buckets over the side of the boat into the ocean that is Churchill's studies and examine what we find about this ever-present phenomenon in his life and thought. 
Churchill didn't just use history in his perorations like other politicians in order to stiffen the sinews and summon up the blood. Instead, he employed it in, his, in the body of his argument, for he truly believed that his generation had a duty to continue Britain's work, which he saw in the classically Whiggish way of being at the forefront of human progress in every sphere. Much of his pugnacity that served Britain so well in 1940 stemmed directly from this belief that Britain had an historical duty to fulfill and that they would be betraying their forefathers if they stepped back from it. When the Chinese demanded the port of Wai Hai Wai, uh, for example, to be returned to them in the early 1920s, Churchill asked the cabinet, why should we melt down our moral capital collected by our forefathers to please a lot of pacifists? I would send a telegram beginning, nothing for nothing and precious, precious little for tuppence. The Harrow School songs that taught him um, that the essentials in history did not change and he must strive uh, like his predecessors had, had a tremendously important um, effect on him. And in December 1906, thanking a Mr. J. H. Anderson for sending him an account of Sir John Moore's campaign in the Iberian Peninsula in 1808, he wrote, it is all one story in spite of every change in weapons from the sheep under whose bellies Ulysses escaped from the cave of Cyclops to the oxen with which De Wet broke the blockhouse line in the Orange Free State. If anyone in the audience uh, can tell me how General De Wet broke the, uh, um, used oxen to break the blockhouse line, I'd, I'd be fascinated to know um, that, by the way. It would be very helpful. For those who like to mischaracterize Churchill's attitudes towards Indians as wholly aggressive and unpleasant, it's instructive to remember the statement he made in August 1909 about the Indian revolutionary Maidan Lal Dingra, who was hanged at Pentonville for the assassination of a civil servant, British civil servant. And Dingra's last words had been, the only lesson required in India at present is to learn how to die, and the only way to teach it is by dying ourselves. Therefore I die and glory in my martyrdom. Churchill wrote to the diarist, um, Wilfred Scorn Blunt, that Dingra will be remembered in 2,000 years' time as we remember Regulus and Caractacus and Plutarch's heroes. And he quoted Dingra's last words as the finest ever made in the name of patriotism. The problem today, of course, is not that... Um, uh, by not being actually taught in schools, we ourselves don't remember Regulus and Caractacus and Plutarch's heroes. As illustrated by the recent survey in which, um, of British school children, in which 30% of them believe that the American War of Independence had been won by Denzel Washington. Chen, uh, Churchill's famous row with King George V over the naming of battleships that dragged on from 1911 to 1913 was essentially about history. Although the king claimed not to have wanted Oliver Cromwell's name immortalized on a battleship because uh, of his brutal repression of Catholic Ireland in the mid-17th century, um, in fact, it was probably Cromwell's republicanism to which he really took exception. Uh, whereas Churchill admired him as the founder of the powers of parliament. Even Churchill's promotion of the name of William Pitt for the battleship in August 1913 prompted the king to complain that Pitt was neither euphonious nor dignified. There's moreover always the danger of the men giving the ship uh, nicknames of ill-conditioned words, words that rhyme with it. Um, His Majesty had been a sailor. He wasn't above the odd scatological reference. It's what one might call Hanoverian sense of humor. Um, he further thought that the name Ark Royal might get called Noah's Ark. Um, Churchill argued that Pitt and Ark Royal had fine precedents around which historical associations of the greatest moment are gathered. Churchill again proposed Pitt, which recalls the two famous statesmen under whom the most martial exploits of our race has been achieved, and said the Ark Royal was the flagship at the defeat of the Armada, revives the glories of the Elizabethan period as the war spike did, uh, and um, ultimately, Ark Royal was built in 1914, but Pitt and Cromwell never were. On the day the Great uh, War broke out, on Tuesday, the uh, 4th of August, 1914, Churchill ex exclaimed to Margot Asquith, my God, this, this is living history. Everything we are doing and saying is thrilling. It will be read by a thousand generations. Think of that. <laughs> 
The First World War gave Churchill many opportunities for calling history in aid during the struggle, as on the 23rd of May 1916, when he said in a speech in support of compulsory conscription, if the Germans are to be beaten decisively, they will be beaten like Napoleon was beaten and like the Confederates were beaten. That is to say, by being opposed by superior numbers along fronts so extensive that they cannot maintain them or replace the losses incurred along them. There he was right. But in the previous year, he probably lent on history too much when he planned and supported to the utmost the attempt to force the Dardanelles. In 1807, Admiral Sir John Duckworth had successfully forced the Straits uh, by ships alone, losing only 10 men on the way there and 29 on the way back. It was not a precedent, uh, of course, ultimately, because underwater mines didn't exist in 1807. And this was one of the times that instead of sustaining Churchill, his knowledge of history led him astray. In the debate on the report of the Dardanelles Commission, Churchill spoke of the tribunal of history, which, of course, is... Um, also a phrase that one hears again at uh, Neville Chamberlain's funeral speech. During the hard-fought discussions over intervention in the Russian Civil War, Churchill similarly had frequent recourse to historical parallels, as on the 29th of July 1919, when in the face of David Lloyd George's demands that all British forces in Russia be evacuated, he said, the whole episode was a very painful one, and to go back into history reminded him of our operations at Toulon and our desertion of the Catalans. He was referring to a botched effort in, in 1813 to open a second front in eastern Spain during the Napoleonic Wars. But it's instructive that the knowledge of history was so deep in the cabinet of a century ago that Churchill could reasonably assume that they would not only pick up the reference, but find it a painful one. If one mentioned the siege of Toulon, the desertion of the Catalans to today's cabinet, um, there were literally only two members who would know what on earth you were talking about. Because, of course, today um, we know that the British Empire in India uh, was evil and wrong, um, because we're constantly taught that in our schools and the universities and by the BBC, um, poor, poor Winston Churchill, in his ignorance, um, could not have known that Britain was viciously exploiting India and giving absolutely nothing back to her. Well, I, I, except, I suppose, for internal peace for the first time in Indian history, as well as railways and the massive irrigation projects, obviously, and political unity of the subcontinent. They've never had that before. <coughs> Mass education, I suppose, has got to be mentioned. Uh, newspapers, unprecedented amounts of international trade, standardized units of exchange, uh, bridges, obviously, universities and roads and aqueducts and docks and things like that. But other than that, absolutely nothing else um, did, did we give India. The abolition of sati, I suppose you've got to mention, the, uh, that practice of burning widows on their funeral piles. We, we got rid of that. And tuggy, of course, the ritualized murders of, uh, of travelers. I suppose we gave them the only incorrupt legal system in the history of the subcontinent and uh, industrial development. And, unprecedented uh, disease prevention projects. Uh, but other than that, <laughs> all one can really mention is the English language and the first national lingua franca and telegraphic communications and two centuries of protections from the Russians and the French and the Afghans and other outside threats, including that obviously from the Imperial Japan that killed 17% of the Philippines population during the Second World War. But apart from that, we did nothing for India. In January 1925, Churchill noted, after meeting the French Prime Minister Gaston Dumergue, that he was personally convinced that Germany would never acquiesce permanently in her condition of the Eastern frontier. The wars of Frederick the Great, as well as those of Peter the Great, had arisen from deep causes and ambitions which so far from having passed away were now associated with great historic memories. Such memories were to the fore when, in May 1930, Churchill complained of the Anglo-German uh, Naval Treaty that never since the reign of Charles II has this country been so defenseless as this treaty will make it. Although, of course, he was open to criticism considering that he himself had done to the Admiralty's cruiser building program in his half-decade-long dec chancellorship that had only ended the previous year. The wilderness years were largely spent writing history. He had a passion for old traditions, a great sense of history, Harold Macmillan said in his, um, in his speech to the other club when, uh, when Churchill died, his panegyric. 
I think perhaps his 10 years out of office when he was writing his life of great, uh, his great ancestor Marlborough laid the basis for his greatness, um, Macmillan said. Once he'd finished Marlborough, he started work on another history book, his History of the English-Speaking Peoples. Yet he was not writing these books merely for the pleasure of academic research, fun though that was. It was always with the motive that history would be, as he put it, helpful as a guide in present difficulties. In 1936, Churchill told his journalist friend J.L. Garvin that our communications cannot be left at the mercy of so unreliable thing as Italian friendship. We must retain that command of the Mediterranean, which Marlborough, my illustrious ancestor, first established. Later that year, he told a dinner of the United uh, Associations of Great Britain and France at Claridge's Hotel that those who embody the tradition and revive the force of Nelson's fleets and Napoleon's armies will not in combination be found a helpless prey. But if to these martial values they add the sovereign conceptions of justice and freedom, then indeed they will be unconquerable. The idea of uniting Nelson's navy and Napoleon's army, which were of course so antagonistic to each other in real life, was typically Churchillian. After all, he wrote a chapter of a counterfactual history book that envisaged a Confederate victory at Gettysburg. In the peroration of his speech attacking the Munich settlement on the 5th of October 1838, he said, do not suppose that this is the end. This is only the beginning, the, the beginning of the reckoning. This is only the first sip, the first uh, foretaste of a bitter cup. And he uh, carried on speaking and said that, we, um, uh, that it, this cup will be proffered to us year by year unless by a supreme recovery of moral health and martial vigor we arise again and take our stand for freedom as in the olden time. That knowledge suffused in him after a lifetime of reading and writing history that Britain was not as morally healthy as she had been in the olden time, tormented him. Yet by articulating it, he was able to taunt the British people into slowly becoming as brave and as morally vigorous and martially health healthy as he and as their ancestors. It's not too much to say that without his lively historical imagination, this, uh, this living sense of history, Churchill uh, could not have warned Britain and the world of what he was to call, with another historical analogy, a new dark age. Today, that analogy would also fall completely flat um, were any prime minister unwise enough to employ it because the dark age is not taught at all in Britain's uh, schools today. After the war had started, he told a victorious crew of HMS Exeter and Ajax at a celebratory lunch at the Guildhall in February 1940, that the warrior heroes of the past may look down as Nelson's monument looks down upon us now without any feeling that the island race has lost its daring or that the examples they set in bygone centuries have faded as the generations have succeeded one another. Um, so the very act of going to war has shown the reintroduction of the martial vigor of as in olden time. On 27th of April 1940, while the Norwegian campaign was being fought, he was somehow able at um, 11 o'clock at night to discuss with his research assistant Bill Deakin and his godson Freddie Birkenhead the strategic position facing Britain in 1066. Deakin recalled how despite naval uh, signals being brought in by admirals as the battle progressed, talk ranged around the spreading shadows of the Norman invasion and the figure of Edward the Confessor, who, as Churchill wrote, comes down to us faint, misty, frail. Uh, Deakin went on, I can still see the map on the wall with the dispositions of the British fleet off Norway and the voice of the First Lord as he grasped with his usual insight the strategic position in 1066. But this was no lack of attention to current business. It was the measure of the man with a supreme historical eye. The distant episodes were as close and real as the mighty events on hand. Once Churchill became Prime Minister, his use of the past as a tool for working out where Britain was in the present became, if anything, even more pronounced. Montgomery recalled how in July 1940 he asked General Alan Brooke um, whether England had ever been in such dire straits before, uh, since the Armada. Yet, as Monty wrote, he showed no outward signs of anxiety in public. In a discussion at Chequers on the 9th of August 1940, he observed of the stand of the 30th Motor Brigade and the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment that May that the men of Calais were the bit of grit that stopped us 
um, sorry, that saved us by stopping them, as Sidney Smith stopped Napoleon at Acre. These references to the Napoleonic Wars in speeches, letters, conversations, the movies he watched, and the books he read during the war undoubtedly profoundly influenced the grand strategy that Britain adopted. In them, uh, Britain had played to her greatest strengths, in this case maritime, and had avoided major continental commitments of troops until her antagonist had first blunted and then broken his army in the wastes of Russia. William Pitt and then Lord Liverpool had played a waiting game, trusting Napoleon to overextend himself and in the meantime confining themselves to peripheral attacks that harassed and frustrated their enemy, only crossing the channel into the Austrian Netherlands, um, present-day Belgium, to deliver the crushing blow. When, and, and they only did that when they judged Napoleon was ready to meet his Waterloo. Churchill largely cop copied that strategy and persuaded the Americans to adopt it too, with the result that Hitler's 12 years in power were even shorter than Napoleon's 15. We have crossed, he wrote, the mysterious boundary which se separates the present from the past. Um, he wrote that in his article, Old Battlefields of Virginia in 1929. We have entered the domain of history. And when America's entry into the Second World War loomed a decade later, Churchill crossed the mysterious boundary several times more to fortify his listeners with the understanding that only history can give. Some say Americans were soft, he said. They would never stand the bloodletting. But I had studied the Civil War, fought to the last desperate inch. By total contrast, Hitler thought the Americans too decadent to make a difference on any European battlefield until the year 1970. Churchill's speech of September the 11th, 1940, included the words, we must regard the next week or so as a very important period in our history. It ranks with the days when the Spanish Armada was approaching the channel and Drake was finishing his game of bowls, or when Nelson stood between us and Napoleon's Grande Armée at Boulogne. We've read about all this in the history books, but what is happening now is on a far greater scale and of far more consequence to the life and future of the world and its civilization than these brave old days of the past. As, the, um, as a Canadian uh, diplomat and diarist who, who said of the effect of that speech on Britons, he makes them feel, he's called Charles Ritchie, wrote excellent diaries, and he said, he makes them feel they are living their history. The effect of telling people that they had the eye of history upon them had the tangible effect of encouraging them to behave in a better, braver, more noble way, to carry themselves in such a way that for the rest of their lives they knew that they would deserve his soubriquet, their finest hour. When the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Sir John Dill, uh, wrote to Churchill in October 1940 explaining why the maverick General uh, Sir Percy Hobart should Hubbard, as it's pronounced, uh, should not be employed in a senior capacity, Churchill naturally reached for the history books to refute his arguments. Cromwell, Wolfe, Clive, Gordon, and in a different sphere, Lawrence of Arabia, all have very close resemblance to the characteristics assembled in paragraph two, he wrote in reply. This is a time to try men of force and vision and not to be exclusively confined to those who are judged safe by conventional standards. D-Day was to prove Churchill right in this, and, uh, and Dill wrong. Even before Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, Churchill gave his family and Jock Colville a short lecture on the various invaders of Russia, especially Charles XII. In his speech at Bristol University in April 1941, the day after a heavy bombardment, he commended the inhabitants' mark of fortitude and phlegm, of a courage and detachment from material affairs worthy of all that we have learnt to believe of ancient Rome or of modern Greece. A few days later, he told Britain's ARP wardens and home guard and craftsmen and women, this is indeed the grand heroic period of our history and the light of glory shines on us all. He allowed them, therefore, to see themselves as part of a great continuum of history. In the confidence debate of the 7th of May 1941, Churchill was careful not to equate Napoleon, his hero, and that of his ally, um, the Free French, with Hitler, saying, it must be remembered, however, that Napoleon's armies carried with them the fierce, liberating, and egalitarian winds of the French Revolution, whereas Hitler's empire has nothing behind it but racial self-assertion, espionage, pillage, corruption, and the Prussian boot 
Yet Napoleon's empire, with all its faults and all its glories, fell and flashed away like snow at Easter till nothing remained but his majesty's ship Bellerophon, which awaited its suppliant refugee. Two months later, he told his old friend and, uh, and comrade Archie Sinclair that he should like to see Mussolini, the bogus mimic of ancient Rome, strangled like Vercingetorix in old Roman fashion. On his way to meet President Ro Roosevelt in uh, Newfoundland in August 1941, Churchill read C.S. Forrester's splendid novel, Captain Hornblower, set in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, one of the only non-fiction books he read during the war. Time and again, Pug Ismay recalled, he would quote from Nelson's Trafalgar memorandum, no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of the enemy. When in September 1941, the king offered Churchill the Lord Wardenship of the Sank Ports, he accepted, despite being daunted by the cost of Walmer Castle's upkeep, largely because of its tremendous historical connections to Pitt, Wellington, and Palmerston. When he heard about Pearl Harbor two months later, his first thought was that, quote, we should not be wiped out. Our history would not come to an end. At the end of an audience with King Farouk on the 7th of August, 1943, the king stood by a big map of North Africa and put his whole hand over Cyrenaica, uh, stating that it had once all belonged to Egypt. Churchill was not going to let him get away with that, and at once replied that he could not remember when. To the best of his belief, it had belonged to Turkey before the Italians took it. According to the British ambassador, Sir Miles Lampson, this, quote, rather stumped the king. Um, needless to say, Churchill was right. Indeed, in the 13th century uh, BC, it was the Cyrenaican tribes that made incursions into Egypt rather than the other way around. One can't imagine what King Farouk could have been thinking of um, trying to make an untruthful historical point to Winston Churchill, of all people. I have a particular interest in King Farouk in that his last mistress once made a pass at me. <laughs> in the rest of the war, Churchill compared Auchinleck's exposed position at Alamein to Napoleon's before Austerlitz. He told Stalin about the battles of Ramillies and Blenheim, who was unimpressed and lectured Churchill back about Waterloo. Uh, he contrasted Cairo in 1942 to Napoleon's defense of Paris in 1814, told the king in April 1943 that if India were finally separated from your majesty's dominions, it would dim our fame in this age to future generations. He told the Royal College of Physicians in February 1944, as we heard earlier, um, the longer you look back, the further that you can look forward. And he noted when he reached um, one of the great rivers in, uh, in Italy, here has Drubal's defeat had sealed the fate of Carthage, so I suggested that we should go across too. I'll stop at the end of the war, though of course there are many occasions afterwards when he cited historical parallels to illuminate and amplify his messages. On the evening of his stroke in 1953, he had earlier that same night been dilating on the influence which Italy had exercised upon the civilization of Rome and how the Roman legions crossing the Alps bore with them something greater than they knew. This might have involved plumbing, as uh, when he met the newspaperman Charles Ede in March 1954, he said, do you realize that from the time the Romans left Britain until the arrival of the American heiresses, this country was completely without central heating? He then went on to speculate, um, he then went on to speculate about what the Romans did about lavatories. Um, as he did not think that anyone has ever found the re remains of a Roman lavatory in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, one stands aghast at the sheer breadth of knowledge of history that Ch uh, Churchill was able, as Ed Murrow, of course, said um, he did of the English language, send it into battle. In this lecture alone, in which I've drawn my examples almost completely at random, I could have included not just dozens or scores, but literally hundreds of other examples. Churchill, just in this speech alone, has mentioned Caractacus, Nelson, Genghis Khan, the Catalans, Napoleon, Babylon, the Norman Conquest, the Elder and Younger Pitts, Carthage, Charles I, the Armada, Cromwell, um, the Battles of Blenheim, Ramleys, and Austerlitz, Charles XII, Wolf of Quebec, Clive of India, the Sieges of Toulon and Acre, General Gordon, uh, Hasdrubal, and Ancient Roman Lavatories. <laughs>
How strange it is that the past is so little understood and so quickly forgotten, Churchill said. How modern those views seem today, yet how often they've been expressed in the past. Pliny, the consul, said much the same thing in his letter number 62 to Albinus, and he died in 115 AD. If our own past is slightly better understood and hopefully not so quickly forgotten, much of the credit, ladies and gentlemen, for that should go to Winston Churchill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, we've got, um, we've got a few minutes. minutes for easy questions. <laughs> Can somebody give this gentleman the, uh, the microphone? So, Andrew, um, as I've told you, I, I loved your past work, Napoleon, the storm of war. Uh, Don't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> my, qu my question is this. Uh, given the body of work out there on Churchill and um, in the wake of Roy Jenkins' uh, fabulous one-volume biography, why are you uh, tackling Churchill now? In fact, is there uh, a different slant that you might have? Yes, very good question. Um, there are 1,000. There are um, 1,009 biographies of Churchill, and um, so why on earth impose a 1,010th? Um, I do hope I'm going to be. I'm not going to be the first person in over a hundred years to write a biography of Winston Churchill that doesn't uh, do well. Um, it, um, that would be a terrible thing to, uh, to have to admit. Um, Roy's book was very good, as you say. Um, it was published in 2001, and since 2001, there have been no fewer than 52 sets of papers that have been lodged at the um, Churchill archives in Cambridge, including really important ones like, um, well, Randolph Churchill's papers have been uh, the, the um, uh, Winston Churchill's son, Randolph. Also, um, uh, Sarah Churchill's papers are there now. There have been all sorts of... Um, of fascinating series of documents and diaries and, and letters that were not available either to Martin or to, um, or to uh, Roy. Um, I am also the first person to be able to, um, through, the, um, through the generosity of um, Her Majesty the Queen, to read uh, the King's Diary uh, for the Second World War. Um, that was not open to, uh, in its entirety. That was not open to, uh, to Martin it, in its entirety. Martin had to use uh, the, um, the published uh, biography by uh, Wheeler Bennett. And, uh, and that is completely fascinating. The, uh, the relationship between those two men is, uh, is going to be a, a pretty much a um, mainstay of my book. Um, I have... Um, basically concentrated on primary sources. Roy never went to, to Churchill archives, never used any primary sources at all. Um, he also wasn't terribly interested in the, in the military strategy. And as you can imagine, having written books on, on this, it's a subject that I think is both fascinating, but also absolutely central to understanding Winston Churchill and the importance of Winston Churchill in history. And the other point about Roy is that he always um, made out Winston Churchill to be a liberal all his life, um, which uh, I will not be doing. Um, so there are different aspects. There's, there's, there's more information. And also, you know, Winston Churchill is such an enormous figure. So many appalling lies have been told about him in recent years, especially since 2001 by the revisionists, uh, that I think every generation deserves to have a great big book on Winston Churchill that puts the truth uh, out there. And so, um, and so I do believe that there's, um, there's space for a uh, 1,010th. Over here. Rudy. His, yeah, the question was um, the um, Churchill's use of American history. Um, Ch Churchill was um, very well up on American history, as you can imagine. I mean, about two-thirds of the third volume of the history of the English-speaking peoples is about the American Civil War. 
Um, it was a, which, and of course, he loved visiting the battlefields of the American Civil War. He had this dream that, um, that the American War of Independence never took place, and uh, as a result, the English-speaking peoples were able to uh, be together and be so strong that the Kaiser was never going to uh, uh, take the risk of, um, of attacking them in 1914, and the world would be a much happier place. Imagine it. No Second World War, no Russian Revolution, no Holocaust, no Cold War. Um, and, um, and so he, uh, he read Alfred Thayer Mann, um, as you'd expect. Uh, he read um, Teddy Roosevelt's books on the 1812 campaign. He was, uh, he was very well read in uh, American history. It was part of his, um, of his you know, the, the drive, uh, the lifeblood of his love of America. Next question is over here. Andrew. What is to be done about the lamentable restriction in teaching of history in the schools, I, I guess in America as well as in, uh, as in Britain. My grandson, who's studying for his A-levels, was restricted to the French Revolution, uh, the, the American Civil Rights Movement, and the Wars of the Roses. And anything in between was completely neglected. What, well, what is to be done about it? Well, can I first of all say, um, next time you're talking to your son, um, congratulate him on the Wars of the Roses. Uh, <laughs> because uh, we have something, it's nicknamed in, in, in uh, Britain um, about our history teaching in school. It's, it's just called Henry to Hitler. You jump from Henry VIII to Adolf Hitler with virtually nothing in between and certainly nothing before. Um, so, um, uh, so he was lucky in a sense. I think that this is a political question. Um, I chaired a advisory group for the Conservative Party in 2005, um, in which I um, uh, and a, a small group of uh, historians gave the, um, which we were appointed by the Tory party, by the Secretary of State for Education, um, on precisely this, on the huge gaps, the way in which um, history of, uh, of really important things in the nation just haven't been and won't be and are not uh, taught. And we gave them this uh, report. I'd love to give you a copy. I'm very proud of the uh, report, in fact. Um, and it was uh, deposited in, I believe, a fairly square container. <laughs> And that's it. So you have to bring, you basically have to um, bring, bring uh, pressure to bear politically on people. And it's, uh, and you are not just, you can persuade the Secretary of State fairly easily. But then after that, um, he has got a educational establishment, um, education, uh, the teachers trade unions. You wouldn't believe the civil service uh, and, their, and their almost anger at the idea that British history can be taught uh, properly and chronologically, including bits that have got nothing to do with Hitler and uh, Henry. It is a, it is a political uh, battle which is still being fought, but is not being won. Next question is over here. Andrew. Could you comment on Churchill's reading habits, given his enormous workload, and could you also comment on his uh, point of view on FDR's domestic policies? Yes, the, um, uh, the workload, uh, the, the, his reading really, uh, he did all of his great uh, philosophical reading when he was a subaltern in, in um, Bangalore in the 1890s, late 1890s. Uh, that's when he read Leckie and, uh, and Darwin and Winwood Reed and all of the, um, of the uh, great writers of the ancient world. Uh, that's, that was when he read his Socrates and Plato and so on. Um, when, I think when you say he was very busy, you might be referring to the Second World War, then he only read two novels, but of course he was, um, he was uh, bowed down with the amount of work that he had in his red boxes, which he did master. Um, and so he didn't have that much of an opportunity to, um, to read beyond the subject then. Um, he had a voracious... Um, love of books. He, lo it, it was, um, and as you're going to, I hope, all come in next uh, year to Washington to discover also a voracious love of Shakespeare and uh, poetry. He had I, what I um, think of as a phonographic memory uh, for musical um, songs and for uh, and for soliloquies and so on. But um, his reading really was, uh, was 
uh, truly um, impressive. It would, be, it would make a, a marvelous reading list for anybody going up to university today, in, fa in fact. Your second question about, um, about the New Deal is a very interesting one because he criticized the New Deal when he was writing his Roosevelt from Afar essay for um, pre-Great um, Contemporaries. He put it into, into uh, Great Contemporaries. Then when, um, when uh, the war broke out, uh, or in fact before that, um, just before that, when he realized that we desperately needed uh, the goodwill of President Roosevelt, he cut it out of uh, editions of, uh, of Great Contemporaries. And then after Roosevelt's death, he stuck it back in again. Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I don't like to uh, ever uh, accuse Winston Churchill of opportunism, but when it comes to his dealing with that particular essay, um, it, let's just say, was um, superb timing. Any more? Well, I'm very pleased that that was a completely comprehensive uh, speech. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. For the record, Andrew, I did not mean to compare you to a fat lady singing. <laughs> but... Uh, for your information, at the end of the Barber of Seville, Basilio is given a choice between accepting a bribe or two bullets in the head. <laughs> we'll let you take, think that over. <laughs> part, another part of our winning formula is to end our conference with remarks by Celia Sands, who is the honorary chair of this year's conference. So I will invite Celia up to the platform now. it's been. It's been really wonderful. And we kicked our off on Tuesday evening with The Darkest Hour, which I thought was absolutely wonderful, and I think everyone else did too. Brilliant portrayal of my grandfather, and such an exciting film. I mean, I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. Yesterday, we had a fascinating series of talks from glittering speakers. As I listened to David Owen, I don't know where he is. Oh, there you are. Where, no, that's Michael Dobbs waving. Oh. <laughs> In his political career, he jumped, or as my grandfather would have said, ratted, on three occasions, from Labour to the SDP and to the Liberal Party. As I listened to him, I wondered how differently things might have turned out if instead of living his political life left of center, he had edged to the right, maybe he would have ended up in that famous house with the black front door. The rest of the day was rich and varied, with wonderful presentations by David Lowe, Alan Watson, Tim Riley, Lewis Lerman, and Thomas Ricks. Thank you all so much. Finally, we had Jane Williams, we lost you earlier, Jane. We were all frenziedly searching for you because we couldn't see you. Because one moment you were sitting over there, and so you went to, everyone went to your room, the whole hotel was searched. <laughs> Nothing but dramas with you. <laughs> Jane's visit to New York got off to a really bad start. I take full responsibility, and I'm so unhappy for the major mess up that I made. I thought I'd anticipated everything. I said, she had to go on what I consider the best flight from London, arrange people to ease her way, and very bossily told her not to say no to a wheelchair because that was the best way to get through immigration. <laughs> I thought I'd got it all, but I hadn't. She turned up at the airport and did not have an Esther, the visa waiver that we Brits need. I had not thought of that, mea culpa. A more fragile flower would have thrown in the towel, but not Jane. 
She, after all, spent her early years with a man whose motto was never, never, never give in, or more informally, KBO, keep buggering on. This she did and arrived the next day as fresh as a daisy. But the problems did not end there. Randall Baker, who kindly went to meet her at JFK, had a board up with her name on it. Jane Williams came up to him and he whisked her off and put her in the car. They hadn't gone very far when he said, you know, making conversation with this woman he didn't know, I'm so looking forward to hearing you speak. And she said, I'm not speaking anywhere. <laughs> At this point, he realized, you know, he's quite a bright fellow, Randall, he realized that he'd got the wrong Jane Williams. <laughs> so. So he, with the wrong Jane Williams, he turned back and drove back to the airport, obviously realizing that the, the real Jane Williams must be, have gone through and perhaps she would have already left. No, there she was. She was just coming through because the person who'd escorted her had picked up the wrong bag. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you? <laughs> Jane enchanted everyone as I knew she would. Thank you, darling Jane. You are living history. And you certainly were the star of this conference. Please God, your return journey is uneventful. <laughs> If not, I don't, I'm not going to take responsibility. I passed it all over to Justin, and he'll be working it out. And as Jane likes people called Justin, so she'll have great faith in him. If not, perhaps you can ask the Archbishop to say a prayer. <laughs> the wonderful speech by Michael Dobbs at dinner last night was a grand finale to a memorable day. Today, we heard Paul and John Bew give a fascinating insight into Churchill's relationship with Attlee and Ireland. Kevin Ruane brought a light touch to what could have been a heavy subject. And, as we heard, it is not over until the fat lady sings. <laughs> Didn't she sing well? <laughs> Andrew, as always, you are wonderful, and I can't wait for your book to come out. I want to thank Michael Bishop, who, this was his first year, and he did brilliantly. I met him just at the beginning of, when, of his tenure, and he came to London, and we discussed this conference. And he was slightly nervous about it, but he did, you did really brilliantly with the help of David Freeman. It is a memorable and most enjoyable conference. Also, Natalie and Justin, whose work is not yet over. <laughs> they have worked really hard and kept all the, oil, the wheels oiled. As always, a million thanks to Lawrence for all he does to make everything possible and for his endless and bottomless generosity. And also, many congratulations to you and Jenny and a huge welcome to the family. <laughs> You're going to have to behave yourself now. <laughs> I've had a lovely time, and I'm so pleased to have seen so many old friends who I've been meeting at various conferences over the last quarter century. With all the exciting prospects for the future, we must never forget that it is those long-time members, many of whom are Blenheim sponsors here, who have held the faith for all these years and who give the International Churchill Society credibility that we belong, that, that we belong to something wonderful. We grow, we change, but our objectives remain the same, to inform and inspire future generations with the inspiring example and leadership of Winston Churchill. Let us go forward together.
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the 34th International Churchill Conference. Thank you very much for attending.